Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson, and on this edition of the show, we're taking a look at the upcoming Strike Force Melendez versus Healy event, which will take place on September 29th, 2012. And mark that day down in your calendar, folks, as we are getting not one, but two MMA events in one day, and it's going to be a fantastic day, 21 fights in all. Earlier in the day from England, we are getting UFC on Fuel TV 5. That fight goes down. I'll have a separate prediction video for for that show, and we'll talk about it in that video. Then later in the evening, we get this event, headlined by Gilbert Melendez, defending his lightweight title against Pat Healy. I'll be breaking all five main card fights down during this broadcast. All five preliminary events available over on the website. Now, as far as the bet packs are concerned, I have nothing to report uh, for UFC 152 because the event has not taken place yet. Now, for these bet packs... If you just want to bet on the Strike Force show, $10 bet pack for Strike Force. If you just want to bet on the UFC show, $10 bet pack for the UFC. But what I'm going to do, and this is what I recommend you doing if you're considering betting on both, because it's going to be a heck of a good day of MMA from start to finish. $20 bucks will get you both bet packs, but it will also get you uh, combined parlays where I take the best bets from both shows, put them together, and it will also get you my top five confidence pick picks and top five value picks from the two events. So 21 fights. I'm going to tell you who my number one pick is out of that day for both my confidence and value picks, one number one through five. So certainly that's the way to go if you're going to be doing betting all day. And so certainly consider investing. Before I get into my first prediction, I always like to thank my sponsors. Thank you very much, MMABettingOdds.com, Fear the Fighter, Fighter Style, Heart and Glory, CouchFighter.co, MMACrips.com, the guys over the Adrenaline Training Center. All the links are available either during with my YouTube video or on the website. I appreciate anybody who hosts and posts my videos. As always, thank you very much. And now it's time to get into my first prediction of the evening. Our first prediction of the evening is in the Strike Force welterweight division as George the Sandman Santiago, 23-10-0, battles 18-2-0 Quinn Mulhern. Mulhern has done an excellent job of late. He has won three in a row in Strike Force since losing his debut to Jason High, including coming off a dis split decision victory over the talented Yuri Villafort. George Santiago, on the other hand, Lost back-to-back -back fights in the UFC, was cut, went to Titan FC and picked up a knockout and then a submission victory, and he's back on track, and now he's dropping down to welterweight, which certainly will be interesting. We'll see how he handles himself here. Now, Santiago, a far more well-rounded fighter when it comes to win totals. 10 wins by knockout, 13 wins by submission. The knock on him is his chin. He has been stopped six times, but it'll be interesting to see. You know, I don't think that plays a role here. Looking at Quinn Mulhern. Three of his wins, only three of his wins have come by knockout. Certainly not the power punching type that's given Santiago trouble in the past. Eleven of Quinn Mulhern's wins have come by submission. Both these guys are BJJ black belts. Quinn Mulhern won his last fight over Yuri Vilfort on the basis of his ground game. And that's what this fight really comes down to. Is it can Quinn Mulhern get Santiago to the ground and can he uh, you know, get the advantage in that arena of fighting. Now, the way I look at it here is Santiago, the last time we saw George Santiago fight a fighter on the mat and and you know, be on the wrong end of it was against Damian Maya at middleweight. And Maya is a world-class grappler, and as good as Quinn Mulhern is, I don't put him in that category. And one thing with Maya, Maya did have success, but Santiago's defense was very good. He used butterfly guard very effectively to elevate Maya and get him off. He did a nice job early on defending, and Maya basically was able to control him but not mount much offense. And as far as I'm concerned, Santiago can do that against Damian Maya. He should have success defending against Quinn Mulhern and keeping the fight where he wants it. And as far as I'm concerned, I would consider that to be in the striking realm. Santiago's got some significant power. We've seen him knock some guys out. His striking game is, you know, is improving significantly. He's working with the Black Zillions and tightening some things up. You know, looking to keep his chin tucked, keep his hands up, and pepper Quinn Mulhern. Mulhern's striking. It's predominantly set up to get the fight to the ground. I, in most of his fights, he strikes and uses those strikes to close the distance, set up the clinch, and take and, and initiate the grappling aspect of the game. Santiago needs to circle away and avoid this situation. Now, if Quinn Mulhern does get on top, as we saw in the Yuri Villafort fight, he's very effective. He's smothering, controlling, and the guy's 6'3", so he has some long limbs and can set up some nice submissions. But uh, the quick, big question is, can he get it there? I would not be shocked if he gets it there once once or twice, but Santiago is a pretty tough guy to hang with on the ground, as far as I'm concerned. This is a big test for Quinn Mulhern. The winner of this fight puts themselves right in the hunt for a title shot is, you know, in the division, in a strike force division. That's got some, you know, welterweight's got some decent contenders. But either way, I like George Santiago coming to strike force. Very much looking forward to this. And a win here for him potentially could line him up with a third fight against Kazumazaki, which would be absolute dynamite. 
Uh, Mulhern, again, I said going back to him quickly, it was a tight fight against Yuri Villafort. Villafort hadn't fought in almost two years, and Mulhern took advantage of that, and he had a lot more success against Villafort when Villafort slowed down in the later ha stages. And I think uh, as long as George Saniango doesn't have a drop off in endurance, and he's a big, you know, he should be fine. He's a veteran, so this type of fight is not going to concern him as far as, uh, you know, making a re debut as far, you know, in Strike Force. And I think it'll be close. But I think George Saniago simply has the better skill set. So my prediction is George Saniago to defeat Quinn Mulhern by decision. Up next, we're in the Strike Force lightweight division as 13 3 1 Isaac Bally Flag battles 23 6 0 Adriano Martins, who is making his debut in another a good addition to the Strike Force lightweight division. I'm very excited to see that. Isaac Bally Flag is on a roll. He has not lost a fight since all the way back in 2007. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Seven, eight, nine, ten wins and a draw. He's 2 0 in strike force. He's coming up a split decision win over Jay Z Calvacante. Adriano Martins, on the other hand, just as impressive a run of late with let's count it up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten wins in his last 11 fights, including a four fight winning streak. He's a veteran of the jungle fight circuit, so this guy's been facing some pretty stiff competition down in Brazil. As far as win loss totals are concerned, Isaac Valley flag fairly well rounded five wins by knockout three by submission he's gone to the decision five times the big knock on him is submissions he's been tapped out three times all a little bit earlier in his career Adriano Martins on the other time big time knockout numbers of his 23 victories 11 have come by knockout he has 10 decisions he's only submitted two opponents now he's been knocked out once in his career and his five five other losses have come by way of decision now Isaac Valley flag back to back split decision victories over um, Sorry, quickly looking over Brian Melanson and Jay Z Cavalcante. The guy's a tough guy. He's very gritty. Against Cavalcante, he struggled early, and against Melanson, he also struggled early. But when he took over in that fight, is when those guys began to slow down and not be able to put the pressure together and weren't fighting as well. He took over and he ground out victories in both those fights. Very interesting to see. He does some high risk maneuvers. He likes to throw a jumping knee. He throws it several times and will attack, attack Jay Z Cavalcante. He, he landed it a couple times. He's a very effective, will work the tie clinch well, that has you know some nice pressure with his upper body work on the cage, and will beat his opponent, and will grind them out. Now on the ground, there are some issues. He's got, he got taken down by Melanson, nearly submitted, got taken down by Cavalcante very early in that fight, and was nearly tapped out via rear naked choke. It was close, and that's certainly something he needs to be very careful of. Now Adriano Martins, dangerous striker. He's very calm and relaxed, and that's something he'll need to be in it making his... Strike Force debut heading over to North America. He needs to be very calm, relaxed, not get too excited early on, and bust his cardio before the fight even hits the end of the first round. He's a very calm striker. He has some very nice low kicks, which could be effective at stopping Isaac Valley Flag's forward push. As he comes forward, if Martins can counter with some low kicks, that'll keep him backed off. He has nice straight punches, which go right down the middle, and that's another thing that Valley Flag will be, have to be very careful about, as the combination of Martins with solid technique and power Isaac Valley Flag has a tendency to take two to three punches to land one, and against a power puncher like Martins, you do not want to allow that to happen too often. I've seen this Adriano fight. He's got some big-time power in his right hand, one-punch ability to knock guys out. It was very impressive. He uses distance well, and you know he does a nice job uh, maintaining, you know, maintaining the pace he wants to maintain and not allowing his opponents to push push him at something he's uncomfortable with. One knock on Adriano, if I, if I will, he holds his hands a little bit low, which is a concern. But against Isaac Valley Flag, you know, Isaac, he uses a nice front kick, and that's something he'll look to implement here to maybe gauge the distance if he can't get inside. But Flag needs to turn this into a brawl. He needs to get in there, work hard against Martins, put him on the cage, and if he has any conditioning issues or, you know, he has, you know, that I like octagon shock or hexagon shock, we'll call it, since we're in strike force. If he has any of that, a grueling style that Valley Flag pushes will expose it. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I really like the skill set of Adriano Martins. He doesn't have the submission game, as far as I've seen, that'll take, that could threaten Isaac Valley Flag, but I think this fight will be contested mainly on the feet. And in that sense, I like the technical fighter with the knockout power. So I'm going to take Adriano Martins to defeat Isaac Valley Flag by knockout and win his Strike Force debut. We continue with our next prediction in the Strike Force lightweight division. Is arguably the number two ranked lightweight in the promotion. Josh the Punk Thompson, 19 5 0 with one no contest, takes on the talented 7 2 0 Carlos, the future Fodor. Thompson coming off that title loss to Gilbert Melendez. Prior to that, he picked up a decision victory over KJ Noons. Carlos Fodor, on the other hand, had his five fight winning streak snapped by a submission defeat at Strike Force Tate versus Rousey against Pat Healy, the man who's now challenging for the title. Looking at their win-loss totals and total fights is a big thing that stands out to me right off the bat. 
Fodor with a total of nine fights in his career compared to 25 for Josh Thompson. So Carlos certainly at a disadvantage as far as experience is concerned. He's got two wins by knockout, three by submission, and two by decision. His two defeats have both come by submission, and that's something you'll have to be concerned about against a BJJ black belt and Josh Thompson, who 19 wins, nine of which have come by submission, four, my, four more by decision, sorry, six more by decision, and four by knockout. His uh, five losses, four by decision, and one by knockout. That's what Fodor looked to do is use his hands. Now, Josh Thompson, his, his advantages, as I said, come in the grappling department, and that's what he'll need to exploit here. And basically, his whole career has come down to in matchups, where is does he have the advantage on the mat or does he not? In the third fight against Gilbert Melendez that he lost, he went two for nine in takedown attempts. When he got beat by Tatsuya Kawajiri fighting over in Japan, he only executed one takedown attempt. It was not it is not successful, and Kawajiri turned the tables, landing six of seven. In the second Gilbert Melendez fight, he went two for six in takedowns, and what seems like ages ago against Clay Guida, Guida was able to put him on his backside 11 times. Flipping the tables, when he dominated KJ Noons, he had four takedowns and a smothering top game, and that's what he needs to do in order to be effective against Gilbert Melendez in the lone fight he beat him. He had six takedowns in that fight, so basically what it comes down to, Josh Thompson wins the grappling battle, he's going to have success. When he fought uh, Pat Healy, Healy, a very big grinding wrestler, and Thompson gave him all he could handle. Healy did have some success there, but Thompson was constantly threatening with submissions and eventually did wear out Healy and catch him with a submission loss, or a submission for the loss. Uh, flipping over to Carlos Fodor, he's not by any stretch of the imagination a novice on the ground. He's a Matt Hume trained fighter, so he is capable. We saw him against, he's got a couple submission wins to his name. We saw him against Pat Healy, take, you know, was able to get the fight to the ground, got on top, had some success. He will threaten with submissions, he will threaten with leg locks, and he is an active guy. But eventually in that fight, Pat Healy was able to take him down, establish his top game, grind on Fodor, break him down, and at that point, it was very evident that Fodor was struggling off his back, and Healy was able to put him away at the uh, the arm choke, the arm triangle choke, which was impressive in Healy, for Healy to finish a guy like Carlos Fodor. If Fodor's going to win this fight, he needs to keep it vertical and standing. His striking is his greatest uh, ass, uh, asset. Josh Thompson, by no stretch of the imagination, is a, is a he's not a poor striker either. He did some serious damage against Gilbert Melendez. He has a nice straight kick that will attack, he'll attack Carlos Fodor with, no doubt. But uh, Fodor has power. We saw him against Justin Wilcox knock him out. He's aggressive. He comes forward, walking his opponents down and putting hands, fists on chin, if you will. And he does nice job, nice work in the clinch. But that's something he'll want to avoid because Josh Thompson has an excellent trip takedown. He did it multiple times against Gilbert Melendez. And we saw Healy have success with against Carlos Fodor. I like Carlos Fodor. This is a big step up in competition. I, I think, you know, he struggled against Healy. And I think Josh Thompson is a more technically gifted fighter than Healy and uh, even though he doesn't have the exact size advantage that Healy had over Fodor I think Josh Thompson simply his grappling will be the deciding factor here the, the striking should be very close the grappling will make the dis, you know will decide the outcome here and I've got Josh Thompson to defeat Carlos Fodor by submission our co-main event of the evening takes place in the light heavyweight division as Gian Valente 10-3-0 battles undefeated 6-0 Guto Innocent. Very nice to see the light heavyweights getting an opportunity to shine in this position. What I think is that the winner of this fight, along with Ovin St. Pru, Mike Kyle, if he does win his preliminary matchup, and of course the returning gay guard Musas and Rafael Fejia when he comes back, will all be in contention to hopefully crown a new strike force light heavyweight champion, something the division desperately needs. Now, as far as Gian Valente is concerned, this will be his sixth fight in strike force. He had back-to-back -back losses to start his career against Chad Griggs fighting at heavyweight, then to Lorenz Larkin, but he's since reeled off three in a row and looked fairly impressive doing so. Six of his ten wins have come by Nako, and that's where his big you know, specialty is. Guto Innocent, on the other hand, six wins, Two of them have come by knockout, three by submission. His debut against in, in Strike Force was at the Barnett versus Cormier card, where he had a decision victory over Virgil Swicker. Pretty dominant decision victory. He put on a striking clinic and was very impressive. Now, physically, uh, in a sense, we'll have a slight advantage. One inch of reach, one inch of height, which could really play a role should this fight remain standing, which it very well could. Now, Volante, he has knockout power, but he's been known to mix in his takedowns. We saw him in his last fight, in his last fight against Meeman, he kept it standing predominantly and beat up Meeman, landed some shots, hurt him a couple times, but he couldn't put him away. Uh, he 
as far as I'm, I, I think he is a little bit too inactive with his striking. He has power, but he has a tendency to attack and then stand back. And he allowed Meeman to, you know, be aggressive. Meeman didn't land a lot, but he was at least aggressive, putting a forward push and backing down Volante when the opportunity arose. In the fight prior against Trevor Smith, he did knock him. It was a little bit controversial, but he certainly showed that he has the power to hurt a guy and drop him. Keith Berry, on the other hand, when he fought Keith Berry. Definitely a not a crowd pleaser. He used his takedowns, basically kept Keith Berry on the mat for long portions of that fight, really did not execute a lot. And that's something with Volante. He will use his takedowns, but he does not seem to have a great top game where he's going to do a lot of damage. Now, as far as Guto Innocent is concerned, he's got submission victories. He's capable on the ground. He trains the Black Zillion, so he's going to be a well-rounded fighter and working with all those guys. But his striking looked fantastic. He only has two knockout wins, but the guy is dynamite. Fast, straight punches. He has an excellent chin because he took some big shots from Virgil Zwicker. Who, and the only reason that wasn't a knockout in that fight because Zwicker was a zombie. If you haven't seen that matchup in preparation for this one, go watch Zwicker versus Innocent. It was great. He has excellent low kicks, body kicks, head kicks. He will batter his opponent with that spinning back fist. He will throw just about anything. He does a nice job of pushing his opponent away and landing low kicks and really battering their legs, and that's something Volante will need to be concerned about. Now, in a sense, in that fight, he did slow down significantly. It partially could have been the fact that Zwigger just took so much damage and, you know, high output by in a sense, just, you know, the punches he had to throw took a lot out of him. It could have been the debut as well, fighting in front of a crowd in strike force. In North America, that could have impacted him as well. But Gian Valente, one thing with him, he's known to slow down. When he fought Lorenz Larkin, he won the opening round, and then he basically he struggled from then on because he got tired. His output dropped off, and he allowed the talented striker and Lorenz Larkin to tee off on him. Even against Derek Meeman, a guy who didn't push Valente that much, it was very evident that Gian in the, in the third round was not the fighter he was in the first round. He was much slower. His hands were a little bit down, and that's something he'll need to be very aware of. Now, a big advantage I see for Innocent in this fight, at least coming off his last fight, is the output. The strikes landed per minute. 5.67 in that fight against Wicker. Volante over his strike force career, he only lands roughly two, three strikes a minute, which is not a high number. And over a 15-minute fight, that's something you have to be concerned with. Now, going back to when Volante debuted against Chad Griggs, I know it was heavyweight. Griggs put a lot of pressure on Volante. Volante struggled with that. And we've seen him struggle with pressure in the past, like when Lorenz Larkin was attacking and picking him apart. And he was very inactive, and he didn't deal with adversity well, and eventually Griggs was able to put him away with a big power shot. And that's something I expect Innocent is going to come forward, use his technical striking, use his leg kicks to really wail on uh, Volante and look to hurt him early and end this fight. There's a good possibility Gian Volante could take this fight to the ground and look to lay on Innocent for the duration. Innocent has some good defensive wrestling. We saw him reverse a takedown attempt and sweep Virgil's wicker, which is pretty impressive because Wicker's a pretty big guy in that sense. And, but we know Volante has been working with guys like Chris Weidman and Constance Filippou over with uh, Matt Serra, so he's certainly got some good guys around to help him train. But I like Guto Innocent in this fight. I'm curious to see what the odds are going to be. I think he'll be a slight underdog based on his lack of uh, notoriety in North America. But I think Innocent wins this fight, so I'm going to take Guto Innocent to defeat Gian Valente by knockout. Our main event prediction will be in the lightweight division as Gilbert El Nino Melendez, 21-2-0, puts his Strikeforce lightweight title on the line against Pat Bam Bam Healy, 30-15-0. Taking a look at Melendez, he is coming off wins over Josh Thompson, George Masvidal, Tatsu Tatsuya Kawajiri, Shin Yaoki, and he unified the title against Josh Thompson. The guy is on a significant winning streak. Pat Healy, on the other hand, he has done well as late of late as well. He has picked up five straight wins, coming off a victory over Mizuto Hirota. He also defeated Carlos Fodor, wins over Maximo Blanco, Eric Wisely, Lyle Beerbaum. He made his Strike Force lightweight debut in a matchup against Josh Thompson, where he was defeated by submission. Now, it's hard to believe Gilbert Melendez, with 23 fights, actually has the lesser experience. 23 fights, 21 wins, 11 wins by knockout, 9 wins by decision. But Pat Healy, 44 fights. This guy's been around forever, and he's not even 30 yet. 6 wins by knockout, 15 wins by submission. There is no denying what Pat Healy does well. He is a very big lightweight. At 6 feet tall, he is a grinding wrestler that uses top control. Against Carlos Fodor, he took him down, he beat him up, he submitted him. We saw the same thing against Maximo Blanco. Took him down, beat him up, submitted him. Eric Wisely, same situation. Used his size against Lyle Beerbaum. Even against Josh Thompson, he had some success and really gave Josh Thompson, a very technically gifted grappler, a lot of difficulty. Gilbert Melendez, on the other hand, not a big number in submission. One win by submission, but he trains over at Caesar Gracie, so the guy's more than capable of fighting against grapplers, working with the, guy, the Diaz brothers and Jake Shields. He's very good 
on the mat nonetheless. And he is a BJJ brown belt. But his prowess is knockouts. He has 11 wins by knockout. And that's where he needs to keep this fight standing. And that's a big thing. If Pat Healy, and Pat Healy's going to have a significant size advantage coming into this bout. Melendez only stands 5'9 compared to the 6 foot tall of Gilbert Melendez. And that's something Pat Healy's done very well, and that's exploit that size. He's going to have a size advantage. He's had size advantage over a number of his opponents. And if he's able to get on top of Gilbert Melendez and break him down, he should be able to control him at least early on. But that's going to be easier said than done. Gilbert Melendez, 71% takedown defense. Very difficult to take down. And that's something, if Healy cannot get this fight to the ground, his striking is his weak point. Gilbert Melendez, 3.56 strikes per minute compared to Healy's 2.55. But Gilbert is a far greater talented striker, more gifted technically anyway. And he has significant power. And that's been the knock on Pat Healy. He has been knocked out several times in his career, in fact four. And looking back at some of his fights against Carlos Fodor and against Maximo Blanco, both those guys who are smaller fighters were able to put combinations together, put and... Uh, put some pressure on Healy and hurt the guy and had him in trouble. Blanco, I think Blanco nearly finished him, and Fodor certainly had him on uh, wobbly legs after landing his combinations. And that's what Gilbert Melendez needs to do. He needs to get in, pound on Healy, and beat him up. If Gilbert keeps this fight standing, he wins. If Pat Healy needs to get on top of him and control him, he still needs to finish Gilbert Melendez. Keep in mind, this is a five-round fight. Pat Healy has only gone the distance one time in his career, and one of the knocks on Pat Healy is is that his conditioning is not that great. Against, jo against Josh Thompson in that three-round fight, he was struggling in round three. He was very tired, and that led to the finish. We even, you know, in a lot of his fights against Mizoto Hirota, he still had to push himself to, con to win that matchup. And it was, you know, he, it was difficult. And against Gilbert Melendez, he's going to be forced to work hard. And I think that's going to cost him in the later rounds if he gets tired. Because Gilbert has showed. He showed against Josh Thompson. He showed several times. He did against Masvidal. He's shown it several times. He can go a full five rounds and fight with a high level of endurance. Now, I was really pushing for Pat Healy to get a title shot. I felt he was very deserving of it. But that Mizuto Hirota fight was not a good fight, and I thought Hirota was robbed of a decision. He was the smaller fighter. He was able to establish the double underhooks. He was able to take Glenn, he or Glenn Healy. He was able to take Pat Healy down with a trip. He was able to beat him up. He did a nice job early on. Healy, of course, did what he does best, endured, survived, established his own takedowns, and put him down, and eventually took care of him. But I think Gilbert Melendez is simply too well-rounded of a fighter for Healy. You know, we saw even Carlos Fodor was able to take Healy down and beat him up early and have some success early. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Gilbert Melendez on top of Healy at some point in this fight, dropping some bombs. He has some serious power. We saw what he did against Tatsuya Kawajiri. He has some nice combinations. And I guess Healy's combination of a, of a questionable chin and... You know, questionable endurance, and this being a five-round fight, there are too many things in this matchup that you know leave me concerned with Pat Healy's ability to win it. So I think he needs to get on top of, of Gilbert Melendez early and go for the finish. That's easier said than done. So my prediction is Gilbert Melendez to defeat Pat Healy by knockout. So those are my main card predictions for Strike Force Melendez versus Healy. My five preliminary picks also available over at KamikazeOverdrive.net. Please check them out. And the bet pack's also available. I talked about them in the intro, so again, you can buy them in the bet shop. Uh, I always enjoy Strike Force cards. I'm looking forward to this one very much. Hopefully, it is the end of a very good day of MMA. Of course, as we talked about, UFC on Fuel TV 5, Strew versus Myochik, also on this event. 21 MMA fights are also on this day. 21 MMA fights all in one day. Should be fantastic. Lots of potential to make money. Thank you very much to all of my sponsors. Thank you very much to all of my listeners for tuning in. And make sure you check out the next broadcast when I break down UFC on FX5, Brown vs. Bigfoot.